This is Karis Alexander. So let's talk about shame. Let's talk shame in the context of the pattern and how it developed from childhood and how this pattern of shame undermines one's ability to come to know and experience its original state of nothingness, that state of nothingness in which one is consumed by the pleasure principle. That is, when one can become consumed by the sensory perception of pleasure and experience pleasure in all aspects of life. Now more than ever is the opportunity for you and I to experience pleasure in all aspects of our lives. Imagine that in a system of consciousness or a physical material world which undermines the pleasure principle every step of the way upon which pain is the natural order upon which most people feel comfortable in this physical dimension. Therefore, what is the underlying truth is that pleasure is not a state in which humanity feels comfortable experiencing within this physical material world, and yet it is the pleasure principle or this experience of pleasure which manifests out of our desires is what we are all seeking. It is important to make note that during this Saturn retrograde that we are currently experiencing or is taking place in our heavens, it provides an opportunity for each of us to address a long established, solidified, psychophysiological patterns within ourselves and the resultant manifest conditions in our lives that result from these patterns, these imprinting that have become crystallized upon which we act out our personality through the biological vehicle based on our programming or our belief systems. So these psychophysiological patterns do include neurological functioning, cellular imprints, and their emotional charge and our resultant that result as our belief systems that we each carry. So when we talk about shame, what we want to talk about is healing the culture of shame that binds us to the collective consciousness. I want to let you know that I will be having all of the articles that I'm sharing here in audio format on the new website blog. So stay tuned and you will be able to have access to the information that I'm sharing on the new website, Curious Magnificence, that is in the process of being developed. Everything that I speak to you about in terms of what I share here is these are aspects or concepts that I'm addressing within myself and I share a perspective of what I am intuitively experiencing as essence through the biological vehicle and the personality charis. What I am expressing to you is very abstract and a manifestation of the transcendence or journey upon which I have been on for 18 years now. What I share with you is based on my own experience about what I am experiencing as essence in the remembrance of the totality of who and what I am as nothing experiencing this physical dimension. It is important to remember that everything that I share here is from my own perspective. I'm not here to convince you of anything. Take what resonates with you and use it in a way that will honor your journey. And so you can find comfort here in these sharings, in the knowing and truth that what I share with you is not just a concept from the mind or an idea from the mind or a stream of thought from the mind, it is actually what I am experiencing that is intuitively manifesting as a result of the experience that I am, ex that I am engaging in as I journey through this physical material reality at a higher vibratory state of consciousness, which is more in alignment with the truth of who I am as nothing, as essence. You see, as my essence, I don't need physical material reality. I don't need, I don't have a need or desire to even be here at this stage of my journey. And yet I still probably have another 40 years to go before I exit this physical dimension. Therefore, based on my blueprint, I am wired 
to share with you at this level. And by sharing at this level, it allows me to solidify, to ground into my construct that I am creating and you are engaging with me in so that I don't allow for the interference pattern of the physical materiality to no longer consume me. Breathe into that. This is all about learning to operate and be at a whole nother level in which the interference pattern of physical materiality no longer affects you, no longer consumes you. This is all about reclaiming one's power, the power that you wield as essence, as nothing, to have dominion over the biological vehicle, the personality that is you, and your physical materiality. This is about not succumbing to your physical material experiences, but to have dominion over your physical material experience. And as we awaken to the knowing and truth of who we are, we become aware of a whole different way of operating in physical material worlds in a way where the general public will perceive what you are doing as magic. And yet all it is, is your ability to vibrate at a higher frequency, therefore being able to what? Manipulate your physical materiality instead of the physical materiality manipulating your essence because you are vibrating at a low vibratory state of consciousness of which most of humanity vibrates at. So this is all about reclaiming your power. Reclaiming your power is about having the capacity to vibrate at a high, higher frequency, the highest frequency possible for you, and e being able to mold and shape reality upon which you can live out the rest of your existence here in physicality. So when we talk about shame and healing the culture of shame that binds the collective consciousness, this is an energetic pattern that keeps most of humanity in a low vibratory state of consciousness. Now is a time more than ever to relinquish this outdated structural state of being that we have created within our physical material reality upon which we experience this physical dimension that was created when we were very young and yet no longer serves us now and is actually a limitation in terms of our growth and expansion into the knowing and truth of who we are as nothing. When we examine the stream of consciousness, you know that nonstop flow of thoughts in our head, we will find it arises as naturally as breathing and centers almost as exclusively on judgmental, accusatory, fault-finding in someone or some event that offends us, threatens us, or fails to meet our lofty standards and expectations, either now or in the future. You see, this train of thought is cellular in origin, beneath one's own volition. Once we understand that the personal self is not manifesting under its own volition, then we can take back control of our lives and our individual world. You know, that individual world that we are creating within the collective world or collective consciousness, whether we realize it or not. You see, we are accustomed to negative thought as it induces our persistent focus. All news that is fit to print would include negative content because without negative content, which is its foundation, we won't pay attention to the cultural process at play. Whether it be in the form of news, television, or politics, or economics, ecology, health, or education, or religion. It doesn't matter what content it comes in. It just must be negative in order for us to focus on it. You see, our attention, demanded by culture, is arbitrary and contrived, very similar to how the U.S. political arena or zoo or circus is playing out in the United States all contrived, all designed in order to direct culture into a state of lawlessness. This is what you're seeing that is transpiring on the physical world stage in the United States. It's bringing in a culture of, or breeding a culture of lawlessness. This political circus that is taking place in the United States, all in timing, in conjunction with this next evolutionary step in human consciousness. I hope you can see the connections. 
You see, our attention demanded by culture is arbitrary and contrived because, as I said, a negative thought will always enlist our attention because it registers in our primary system as a threat. And once that occurs, we are hooked. Let us look at judgment as the act of the mind. Being judged by someone offends us if the judgment is true and more so if it is false. When we accuse or judge another, it has the same effect on us as being judged ourselves. Imagine that. Any judgment we make, no matter what registers in the heart as a disruption in relationship, and the heart dutifully responds on behalf of our defense, shifting neural, hormonal, and electromagnetic systems from relational to defensive. It is our sensory system that reflects these shifts, and our experiences change accordingly. Although we may perceive such events as neural phenomena of our world to whomever responds, we are simply living out our underlying pattern of relating. We are judged, and as such, we have judged, sowing with ignorance, weeping with tears. Now the world upon which a child constructs will be one shared with its mother, as all mammalian young are generally driven to interact with the objects and events within their environment upon which they build their neural imprinting. That is when an event in one's mind evokes strong imprinting. Therefore, any new or event powerfully signals our young to interact with it in order to build a structure of knowledge. And, as a rule, with their initial encounters with their environment, infant animals check for their mother's okay, which is given through a variety of subtle sensory cueing before the child interacts with the new phenomena. This is the type of interaction that happens between a child and its mother. It's a natural phenomena of the child and mother bond. Again, as a rule, when a child initiates encounters with its environment, it will check for its mother's cues or okay, which gives the child a variety of subtle sensory cueing so that it knows whether it should or should not interact with the new phenomena. This is a patterning that happens between a child and its mother. So whether in the nest or the home, all objects and events are safe for interaction for a child in its own mind, but in the great outdoors, caution is the rule. The toddler points to something unknown and checks the caregiver or mother's response. If positive, the toddler follows through with the complete sensory in inventory of the phenomena, tasting, touching, smelling, listening, and talking to it in order to build from it a structure of knowledge. Such imprints include the name, if given, and the emotional state experiencing the exploration. Thus, the world of the child constructs will be one shared with its mother. Seldom will a young child disregard a mother's cue that an object or event might be dangerous. Such warning is a primary signal upon which the mammalian has depended on throughout history. Obeying a warning signal is still one of the strongest instincts encoded by our ancient sensory motor and emotional cognitive systems. Should a parent's directive be ignored by the toddler, the parent's encoded survival signal fires and can cause an upset or anger on the part of the parent. It is important to know that our language has largely supplanted warning calls, like no. No can replace a whole complex of signaling. No, that is the word no, not only triggers same reactions as our ancient ancestors' responses to the saber tooth, but also may include mother's wrath, which is a never greater threat. Abandonment by the mother is the greatest of all a child's fears. It is simply a fear is close to death. In infant mother dynamics, action automatically models for an infant's action, whether in the safe space of the nest or outside it. Shame acts as a major force in shaping the infantile self. And what kind of self, this is no small matter. Shame, stress, it is an essential effective mediator of the socialization process. Shame 
elicits a greater awareness of the body than any other emotion. You know, it is shame that is induces specifically long stress reactions. It is shame that creates a split between self and body, an inner rejection of the body, which grows into a larger rejection of the larger body of humanity, which manifests as rejection of the earth, which is demonstrated in the rape and desecration of our planet, rather than the acceptance of self as a whole being as nature intended. Therefore, this shift of shame as a major force in shaping the infantile self occurs at the end of a toddler period when the child moves from the pleasure principle to the reality principle and this takes place through shame that is when the toddler moves from the darkness of pleasure to the light of reality when it naturally explores its world of pleasure herein looms the lifelong cultural verdict from east to western cultures pleasure is bad and pain is good what this says to a toddler is we are full of self-love in a grandiose sort of way, being born with an exuberant inborn love of self and life that is our essence, our quintessence. And then as we grow into adult, then that blooming pleasure becomes distorted and the exact opposite occurs when one gets older and become self-loathing, being more suited to live in the culture of the world. And is this constant looking to the mother for external cues when a child is in that exploratory stage and then is told no when it is in that exploratory stage in its natural state, it is getting conflicting cues from its external reflective. And this causes a split. This causes an imprinting on the toddler, which creates a sense of doubt and confusion, early imprinting. So remember, as a young child, everything is wonderful, exciting, inviting, and entrancing, which draws a child into an intimate rapport and total involvement and interaction with its outer world. However, once shame is imprinted, doubt intrudes and clouds our knowledge of the self and the world. However, the work of shame does not stop with doubt. It brings about shame stress, which creates an overload of cortisol and depression and withdrawal in children who experience psychological abandonment or separation anxiety, which will translate into adult psychological abandonment and anxiety issues when the adult is relating to others. Therefore, the effects of shame from a toddler's transition from joyous, happy state of effort without stress to a helpless, depressed state of distress without effort, or what we now call learned helplessness, this is, indicates to each of us how early in the game the fall of the human from its grace, from its quintessence, from its essence into culture and how early the fall comes about. The reason I bring this to your attention is one of the things that I find over and over again is as I'm working with people is to bring them into that state of pleasure and getting them to stay in that state of pleasure, which is a natural state of nothingness. And simply by that act of moving to a state of pleasure, that is a state of desire, that is a state of being your creative expression, that is a state of a thought or something that brings you a sense of joy and peace and well-being, that when I attempt to bring people to that state, they don't want to stay there. I hope that what I'm sharing with you today may provide an underlying reason as to why that is. Because we are so used to experiencing pain and getting gratification and sustenance from pain that to even conceive of pleasure makes one feel uncomfortable. And yet that is all in which we are seeking. If ever there was a time, now more than ever, is a time for you to remember who and what you are. And that in remembering who and what you are, pleasure is what you are to experience in this physical dimension. This is why I say it is important to become curious about your magnificence. You are to experience pleasure and you are to experience the abundance 
of pleasure and its manifestations through materialism. And so if you're denying yourself the abundant experience of what you can experience in physical physical form that is materialism then you have bought into the program or the culture upon which dominates most of humanity and that is the principle of pain rather than the principle upon which your essence quintessence is a byproduct of and that is pleasure so contemplate what i'm sharing here it truly is a glorious time it truly is your right to relish and experience the divine glory that is you. You are to experience your exquisite nature as pleasure. Imagine that, that you are to live out the rest of your existence from a state of joy, from a state of peace, from a state of paradise, from a state of happiness. And that is your divine right to do so. I thank you so much for tuning in. It truly is a glorious time to be here.